Good morning. My name is Mansfield Matthewson. I'm director of purchasing at Grand Rapids Community College, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to Networking 301. Thank you for being here this morning. First of all, I would like to thank our sponsors. We'd like to thank Ranger, Mike Golub. We'd like to thank Office Max, Don Marshall, and Cisco, Austin Gary. We have a distinguished panel this morning that's going to go through some questions that will hopefully help you connect with the education sector as far as doing business with us. And I'm going to start at the far end here and let them introduce themselves. Good morning. I am Candace Waterman. Not Diana Farnham. That's okay. Um, I am with the Michigan Women's Business Council, or SEED, if you will. I am the certification program manager there, and the um, whole state of Michigan is my territory. Good morning. I'm Esther Burns, purchasing services manager at Grand Valley State University, and would like to welcome everyone this morning, and hope you'll have a fruitful day. Thank you. I'm John Lyon from Michigan State University Purchasing. Uh, I'm a contract administrator there, and that's uh, somewhere I said that we should have a few facts. And of course, we're in East Lansing, and I think we have about 44, 45,000 students. Good morning, Valencia Cooper with the Michigan Minority Business Development Council. We are a nonprofit um, certification agency for for profit and nonprofit entities. Um, we cover the entire state of Michigan, however, the Grand Rapids office covers the west side of the state. My name is Joe Doyle. I'm from Muskegon Community College. I'm Associate Vice President of Administration, and one of my duties is purchasing. Muskegon Community College is a Population, student population is about 4,700. We're a two-year community college. I'm going to ask our panelists this morning some general questions to help you again connect with us as far as doing business with the education sector. Afterwards, we'll have a period of time where you'll be allowed to ask questions. And I'm going to begin with Mr. Doyle from um, Stephen Community College. At what dollar amount is an RFQ required? Is there a business outside of the RFQ process? If so, can I be considered for that business? Yes, our uh, policy has our RFQs at $25,000. So for our size school, which is relatively small, we're about a medium-sized community college at 4,700 uh, population. Um, so our, our, uh, the amount of times that we have RFQs at 25000 is somewhat limited. but. Uh, other than those formal RFQs that go out at 25000 there are other opportunities for vendors to uh, bid on different items or projects that we have. Uh, the only thing that we, re we require is to fill out a vendor profile that we have available. I have those available today at, at my table. But we also send those out uh, annually with our W-9 requests to all of our past vendors and uh, any vendor that inquires to work with the college, we send them that package of information and they fill that out and then they're part of our package of uh, vendors. Mr. Doyle, I don't mean to oversimplify, but what is an RFQ? Request for quotes. Yeah. <laughs> we use the RFP, request for proposal a lot, and, or an RFI, request for information. Um, it's all different language. Great. Esther Burns, Grand Valley State University. In terms of the procurement process, how does the education sector differ from the industry and private sector? Probably the, the most um, unique factor is that we operate at Grand Valley State with what's uh, traditionally referred to as um, a decentralized purchasing environment, meaning that We've uh, delegated a certain amount of responsibility back to the departments where they can go ahead and initiate orders we call small dollar orders, typically, um, you know, $5,000 and less. And beyond that, um, then the purchasing office will assist them with um, collecting some quotations and what have you. And at our threshold is at $25,000 for sealed bids. So we would assist departments at that level. So that's probably the, 
the, the, the biggest difference. Another um, is that we've instituted a purchasing card program that allows the departments to purchase those small dollars uh, orders with. So there's a few other tools that uh, might vary that maybe the uh, uh, private sector wouldn't necessarily, you know, institute. Thank you, Esther. Um, John Lyon, Michigan State University. Am I allowed to fill a department order without a purchase order? Um, no, you're not, unless <laughs> we do have a purchasing card also. Um, so at, at a price point of uh, $2,500 per transaction. So if um, a department gives you a purchase uh, card, yeah, you can do it that way. But uh, anything other than that outside of the purchasing card, uh, you have to work with the purchasing department and no goods or services. Uh, should be provided until you actually have a purchase order number. Even at uh, the smaller schools like Muskegon Community College, about a tenth the size of, of MSU, we also always require a purchase order. It, but it doesn't stop certain people from going out and using Joe Smith as the PO number or put the today's date as the PO number. So, you know, we do have some, some problems with that, but we do require a purchase order also that has to go through our office. College. Will that enhance my opportunity to receive contracts? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, we're, we're a public institution. We deal with public dollars. I guess that's another differentiation uh, from an educational institution to, uh, to uh, what I call the real world business. But uh, no, the, the main way to get on our bid list is to fill out our vendor profile and be part of our a listing of vendors for various activities or various products. But uh, no, just because you're alumni, it won't help. I might add that um, you chuckle about that, but we get those calls all the mm -hmm. time. Salespeople, that's their lead in, and, you know, as if it will uh, influence our decision. But I, I don't know about anyone else, but I, uh, congratulations. What can we do for you? <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. So, um, but likewise, at, at Grand Valley, it, it's not a preference. Um, you know, it, it's an uh, open opportunity for everyone. And we, obviously, we don't have any preference for that either. But with our campus, um, I would say knowing your way around is an advantage in itself. So um, from a business standpoint, no, but from a familiarity standpoint, definitely it helps you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to leave this question open for any of the schools this morning because I'm sure it's a hot subject. Does your organization have goals for doing business with women and or minority businesses? I'm going to leave that one open. Whoever likes to speak to it. I'll start off with it. Okay. Yeah, we have goals. Uh, we, we review those annually. We see how we've done with them. They're, they're self-imposed uh, goals. And obviously, each year, we take a look at how the economy is doing, how we performed against our goal the previous year, and we increase it an amount that we think is you know realistic to, to be able to attain. But... Um, it's all just good faith and our best effort in, in trying to create opportunities through communication. So that's pretty much how our program works. Likewise, at Grand Valley State, it's a program of, of uh, being <coughs> inclusive, and we want everyone to have an opportunity to uh, participate in, in um, the bidding and other contracts that uh, are available. So our uh, program is pretty much um, a good faith effort. We do have some goals that we try to achieve, but they are not um, hard dollars or percent, um, you know, driven. So it, it is uh, pretty flexible in that regard. Well, Valencia and Candace, I don't want to leave you out. What resources do you offer um, for qualified, diverse suppliers? <laughs> um, MBDC, as I said, we are. Uh, nonprofit organization and so we certify based on ethnicity and that would be the five um, categories of African American, Asian Pacific, Asian Indian, Hispanic and Native American. Um, we bonify to corporate and nonprofit organizations that a business is 51% owned, operated, and controlled. So as a certified business, you would receive a certificate every year. You have to recertify or sign an affidavit basically saying none of that ownership or operation has changed. But that's a part of the marketing tool that you can use um, to market your business um, to other companies. And so as a service, we provide that certi uh, certification for um for corporations. 
As an additional resources, um, we also provide training or professional development because many businesses are in different stages. Um, they could just be startups where, you know, they put their sign out yesterday or they've been in business for 10 or plus years and need some assistance with advancing um, or going over to the next level in terms of um, their operation or their capacity. And so we look at how can we help businesses, again, in all stages. Um, and it's not really just the business owner. It could be someone who's in sales, who's just um, become a part of the organization, not really familiar with supplier diversity, um, where your customer base reflects your, um, uh, your vendor base. But really helping all of those um, different departments within the organization um, increase efficiencies in operations. Also, we provide um, networking opportunities. And so it's not just you get a certificate in hand and we say, you know, best of luck to you. Um, we also provide the training and development as well as the networking so that you can get in front of organizations like the schools and universities as well as those for-profit organizations to begin to um, really be able to sell and engage those, um, those organizations. So it's the certification, it's the training and development, and it's the networking opportunities. And with respect to Michigan Women's Business Council, like my colleague, they are um, cultural specific. Our certification is gender specific for women. We offer some of the same opportunities in terms of the technical training um, components, mentoring programs um, for businesses that are at their infancy or beginning stages, you know, on through to taking them to the next level. The other thing that we do is, um, really connect you with the people that want to do business with you, which is the most difficult thing, if you will. Um, by no means the certification guarantee you um, any specific contracts, if you will, but it does get you past the gatekeeper and in front of people that really want to do business with women and see the value in doing that. Um, we offer uh, corporate connections a few times a, a year where we put you, again, it's kind of a speed dating, if you will, for business. Um, and so we do that a couple times a year and have been very successful with multi-million dollar contracts coming out of that um, event, as well as we really implore the women to do business to business because while you get certification to go after what you will the corporations you really cannot miss that mid-range which is doing business with each other quite frankly so that is um, another uh, component that we add and again not just giving a certificate once a year but being a resource throughout the course of the business thank you having heard from our business resources mr. Doyle what resources do you use to locate qualified diverse suppliers? We look at a, a number of resources and, and obviously we look at our, our past vendors that we've worked with. Um, we look at basically we're, we're very open to any business that would like to be a part of our vendor list to come and have a meeting, you know, just show us their product line, let us know about their activities or their products or their services that they offer um, and we're, we're, we use that database as a starting point at least when we look at, at uh, major purchases. Esther, what about Grand Valley? Um, it, it, it operates pretty, pretty similarly. Um, we have, uh, you know, open um, open door policy and and actually one of the uh, the other things that maybe differs in in the in the uh, public sector from from private that goes along hand in hand with this is that a lot of the documentation is available for for viewing to um, the suppliers either you know um, maybe just before a bid or or just after you know the bid so we do encourage you to you know consider that as well mr. line I'd like to know if I'm ready to bid as a vendor does your institution require that vendors be pre-qualified? And if so, what is the process? Um, actually, just to bid, we typically don't require a pre-qualification. Um, that may vary a little bit depending upon uh, what the request for quotation or request for proposal is about. If it's a very specific kind of a thing to deal with, you know, broadcast technology, for example. Obviously, it, it makes sense to try and only bring people in, into uh, the full that are able to perform that specific kind of a task. But generally speaking, um, if you are made aware of a bid that's out there and you want to have a shot at it, you're, you're welcome to do that. And you can just call 
uh, the purchasing department and inquire about it, and we'll typically just get you a copy. Now, uh, in order to be awarded, um, similar to Joe, we ask you to fill out a vendor profile. has things like your federal tax ID and other specifics about your company. But uh, pretty much anyone can just bid. Thank you. Mr. Doyle, what resources are available for me to locate bid opportunities at your institution? All of our major bids, anything that we believe will cost more than $25,000, is normally advertised publicly. And we use a couple of different um, arenas for that, either just legal ads in the local newspaper as well as the, for us, the Grand Rapids Press is another source that, that we use. It depends on the, on the project. Um, other than that, uh, we use our vendor database to, to look at m most of our bids. Again, because of the size of our college, many of our purchases are at a very small level. So we look at that. Uh, basically, it's an interaction with the vendors. If they're that interested, they'll continue to let us know that they're interested in our in our business and continue to want to set up meetings or update their line card or whatever. But it's that individual communication that, that helps a lot. That's a great segue for my next question for Esther Burns. I've seen a bid opportunity advertised in my local paper. I know that I can provide the goods and services required, but I don't know where to begin with my pricing. Is there any information available that um, yes, I'd say contact the purchasing office um, first, and um, you can certainly meet with the the buyer that's leading that particular bid, and um, discuss you know what is expected in in the way of uh, the response proposal. We've even had vendors on occasion ask, "Can we see a previous bid?" Sure, we can share that with you, so you can take a look at maybe previous responses and what format you know, it was presented in, um, kind of get a, uh, an idea on maybe the price point that you should be looking at when you're going to submit your proposal. But some of that information is available to you. Um, certainly the, the buyer can also um, educate you as far as any pre-bid meetings that might also be uh, required, any tours that might be uh, um, associated with that bid as well. So there's a number of factors that the buyer can certainly help you with. and. Um, if, uh, if need be, we can also bring in a department representative who we're bidding on behalf of, and, and we can um, cover more of the specifications in detail if that's necessary as well. I'd like to add to that real quick. Yes. Um, also, if you're kind of keep an eye on the university, um, I encourage people to participate in sealed bid openings for us. That's uh, projects over $25,000. Even if you don't actually submit a bid, those are open to the public, and they're very informational because you can show up and see how other people responded. Maybe it's not right on the money for the goods or service that you offer, but you can see how the process works and see how people respond. And, and that way, when you do have something come up that you're interested in, you, you've been involved. That's all. Thank you. I have a business etiquette question here. I'm going to leave this one open. For marketing pur purposes, am I allowed to telephone make cold call visits or schedule meetings directly with various departments at your institution? If not, what's the procedure? Well, at Muskegon Community College, that happens daily. Um, we have a, somewhat of a decentralized initial starting point for a lot of our goods and services. There are many specialized areas. Purchasing as a department runs all the paperwork, but we don't necessarily initiate all the, the uh, initial requests for information. But we, once that is formally uh, received by the purchasing department, we have to go through certain steps to do that. But any vendors at, uh, that are interested in various programs or, or services at the college can deal with individual staff, uh, but we do prefer that, that we're at least notified of that interaction so that the purchasing department has an idea that, uh, that those vendors are out there. Thank you. Any others? I'd like to add that uh, we too would encourage you to stop by the purchasing office and um, first of all you heard from uh, several of the other schools already about uh, being registered and there are a number of departments that that are curious as to whether or not you are registered with uh, with our office and so that would behoove you to stop by and see us in that regard. Um, 
But in order to save you the time of cold calling on a number of departments, we also like to host what we call facilitated meetings where we might bring to um, you know, the, the room the department representatives so you're not having to cold call on each of them, but bring those representatives to a meeting where you have an opportunity to do a presentation and, and reach the mass versus one at a time. Um, but we found that, that that also works. The other thing is there might already be certain contracts in place for uh, the commodity or service that you might be offering, and so the department, um, you know, is aware that maybe they need to, you know, adhere to that and might refer you to, to check in with the uh, purchasing office first. Good. Thank you, Esther. Mr. Lyon, how important are the marketing materials you receive from vendors? What in the world do you do with all that material? <laughs> <laughs> and what recommendations do you have for vendors regarding their marketing materials? Um, that's a, okay. that's a pretty good question. <laughs> yeah, actually, we get so much of it. Um, very often, the truth is, if it's unsolicited, at best, I may take a very cursory look at it and, and file it away. Um, occasionally, I mean, I think the, the, the trick is when you're doing something like that is to, again, try and solicit some interest from someone in the department. And that way, when you hand your... Uh, your information off. You've already got someone at least interested enough to look at it. We're, again, we're, we get so much of it. Um, it's very difficult to try and read it all. We just can't. Esther, I left a voicemail with the Grand Valley buyer. I'm sorry. I left a, a voicemail with your Grand Valley buyer. I haven't heard from him yet. <laughs> what should I do? Should I just drop in and make a personal visit? Um, I you know, I'd say be persistent in some respect, but you know what? The first thing is I have to point out that we get a lot of cold calls just like we, we get the materials. A lot of voicemail messages, and it could be as simple as I didn't understand your message. Make sure it's very clear and, and to the point, not a really long message, but leave a, a contact number where we can reach you. But again, very clear. We have so many that... Da, 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 da. And what did they just say? And I can rerun that thing three times and still not understand. So it could be as simple as that. But, um, but certainly um, do communicate again. And um, I should say that in most purchasing departments, well, I should say larger schools, there may be more than, than one individual that you can encounter. Um, and, and maybe you're more successful with one over the other. I know at, at Grand Valley, um, we have a smaller staff that doesn't allow us to specialize by commodity or service, but we departmentalize, so each one of us is responsible for so many departments, and we assist them. And there is some overlap as far as, you know, the, the product or service, but uh, by and large, you know, that, that individual is the one that you need to be talking with anyway, so um, we can uh, attune you to that. But check the... Um, Check our website. We also have it listed there as to who's responsible for which um, departments, and, and uh, we can certainly be in touch with you in that regard. But again, clarity of, of the voicemails and, and to go back to some of the materials that are coming in, I'd say you know maximize the value of it by keeping it brief and something with more bullet points on your product line I think goes a, a lot farther. And we'll share that with our departments as well. I know for myself, the most frustration I get with voicemails is that I'll get a nice, detailed voicemail and then the phone number. <laughs> and so many times it's hard to really distinguish what's being said. So she's right. Clarity is really important. Yeah. In my position at Muskegon Community College, uh, purchasing is one of the activities that I deal with. I also deal with physical plant, all business auxiliary services, risk management, graphics, a myriad of other things. So if you can get to my voicemail um, and I get an opportunity to answer it, it's very difficult for me to, to answer all those calls. Uh, probably the best way in my situation would be to contact our business office and attempt to make an appointment with me or, or purchasing representative to be able to actually do a face-to-face -face meeting would probably be the best way. I'm going to skip to our business resource panelists this morning. And I'm going to direct this to Ms. Waterman. Why should I certify my business? Is it essential and what are the benefits? When I'm asked that question, I, I actually answer with the resounding why not. If you are 
a woman-owned business, by all means, you should seek certification. If not for any other reason, while the certification is obtained here in Michigan, our certification is a nationally recognized certification. So depending on what the product or services that you provide, it's incumbent upon us at this stage of the game to think outside of the box, if you will, and outside of our own backyard. So that certificate can definitely lend you to take you to the next level. So that, that in and of itself is my answer is simply why not. Would you like to add to that? Um, sure. I guess uh, along with Candace is, is really um, giving back the question to um, any applicant or prospective applicant is um, what's driving your reason for certification? And depending on what your ethnicity is and your gender, there's actually two or even more that you can go for. And so really looking at it from a, a business standpoint in terms of um, are corporations, are the companies seeking my product and services? Am I in a flat market, a declining market, or a growing market? Um, and then once you've been able to determine that and saying, okay, are companies actually looking for my type of business, my ethnic or my gender-based business. Once you're able to answer those questions, then go to well, what agencies are out there and beyond just the certification or the certificate, what other resources are available? Because again, it's looking at the networking. It's really all about who you know and more importantly, who knows you, who knows your business, who understands that you are a very viable business. Within these circles of certification agencies, it's we are bringing businesses together. And so when you look at it in terms of the pros, there are some cons because there are some financial um, obligations tied to the certification, um, but the, the, the pros certainly outweigh the financial um, you know, uh, responsibility that you have in terms of keeping up that certification because, again, you're getting to know people, you're establishing relationships, you're getting into doors that you may not otherwise be able to get into. Mm -hmm. With companies and organizations such as these, they get a thousand emails, a thousand phone calls a day. It's really being able to say above and beyond just receiving phone calls and emails that, okay, I actually met you at this um, networking opportunity. We had a chance to talk for about five minutes. I'm following up with that. You were there looking for diverse businesses or gender-based businesses. I am one of those. That's the icing on the cake, not the meat. And it's really the gravy and saying that above and beyond everything that I'm able to um, provide you, I am certified. And so really looking at it in terms of is this a marketing tool that my business can utilize. And just to piggyback on that as well with respect to the certification while it's national, um, there are, you become part of uh, the database, if you will, of certified um, companies. And we have corporations calling us quite often, uh, emailing and calling every day looking for companies in which to do business with. Because while we talk about certification, it's a daunting task. It really is. So if corporations or entities know that you've gone through the certification, you are realistically looked at as a viable company, if you will. So from that vantage point, you not only know what, who it is you're looking for, but you never know who's looking for you and who's going to come to us as the certifying bodies to ask for your type of product or service as well. Thank you, Candace and Valencia. I'm going to ask you both this question. There's so many organizations that I can certify with. Which are the most advantageous for me? Um, again, to uh, echo what Valencia said, you have to look at who is the client or the person that you want to go after and what is their quote unquote requirement or mandation, if you will. Um, from a broad stroke perspective, you can look at, again, your WBE certification and your MBE certification. But is it a company that's requiring DBE, which is your disadvantaged business um, certification? Are they looking for um, uh, uh, the municipality, are they looking for self-certification? You really have to seek out with whom it is you're going to do business with and what their requirements are. Um, along with Candace's remarks are um, really looking at the organizations and what their reach is. Um, and not to say that smaller organizations won't give you the um, bigger bang for your buck, but really understanding what type of member membership they have. Is it a growing membership? 
um, you know, what types of, what other companies they've already certified that you could possibly do business with, because again, we also advocate for minority business to minority business um, development as well in saying that, you know, everyone wants that GM or that MSU or that U of M cert um, uh, contracts, but all of these other companies that sit around them are just as good their money is just as green, and so why not go after them as well? And so really looking at how um, aggressive or uh, progressive an organization is, and that should also help determine if that certifi certification agency is one in which you want to be a part of. Well, I think our panel's done a pretty good job. Can we give them a hand? <laughs> We are very privileged this morning to have Bing Goy with us. Bing is the president of the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. Bing has been instrumental in establishing MAP, the Multiracial Association of Professionals. He's the owner of Eastern Floral. He's one of the most successful minority businesses in the greater Grand Rapids area. And we've asked him to speak to you this morning. After him, we're going to have Jessica Ann Tyson, who is the president and CEO of parties by Jessica Ann, and while they're speaking, I'd like for you to, to uh, think about your questions, and after they finish, the panel, as well as the two of them, will take your questions. Me. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this uh, great event. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Eastern Floral. We, are, uh, uh, we have five locations, three in the Grand Rapids area, one in Grand Haven, one in Holland. We are opening our sixth location near downtown Grand Rapids in 2007. And, you know, <coughs> we, I've owned Eastern Floral since, uh, <coughs> since 2001 when uh, I was a successful bidder for the Eastern Floral uh, market uh, in the bankruptcy sale. Eastern Floral was uh, purchased in 1998 by a national company that did the roll-ups, as you remember, in the 1990s. There was a, a real move to do some roll-ups in some certain kinds of industry, and uh, someone from the uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida area had thought of and, and created a business plan that wanted to purchase all the major retail flower shops in the nation and establish a national brand uh, for floral uh, products and in five years they went bankrupt. And so we were fortunate enough to be able to purchase that and since then we have been blessed and been able to reach a top 50 status in the country as one of the top 50 florists of the, of the largest floral wire organization called Teleflora. So we're very proud of our staff and proud of this community because this is, you know, this is something that this community has been uh, instrumental in getting us to attain that, that, that uh, goal. It's, uh, it's almost inevitable that I have to talk a little bit about the political scene of what happened yesterday. Uh, we certainly you know, experienced one of the most expensive and uh, highly contested uh, campaign in history. And yet today the question is, are we better off today than yesterday? And my answer is yes. Yes. Not because who, of who was elected or not elected, but because the alternative, not being able to vote yesterday, is worse. We live in a great nation and a great state with weaknesses, but also have good people who can make a difference, people like you. Today is a new day, a day in which you and I will be asked to do what our politicians are unable or even are unwilling to do, which is to change our economy. In order to do that, we need to know what will change our economy. What can we as buyers and vendors and service providers do to change the downward spiral of our state's economy? My friends, this morning I want to tell you that you are the solution to what ails our economy. In spite of what you have heard for the last six months from our politicians, the tax cuts, stopping outsourcing, China, etc., you know, they are not the only reasons for the state of our economy. They are certainly factors. What our politicians unfortunately did not address is the role that small businesses play and has historically played in a strong or weak economy. Our state needs to take a look at the tremendous contributions made by our small businesses, businesses that you and I own or manage. Now just think, in Michigan, over the past four years, we have lost, based on some statistics, 100,000 jobs. Yet, from 2004 to 2005, small businesses 
increased from 765,000 to 822,000, an increase of 57,000 new small businesses in one year in the state of Michigan. Now, if our state leaders would have worked to help these 50, 57,000 new businesses grow, enabling them to hire just two new workers, we would have needed 114,000 new workers. We would have to go to Wyoming to recruit workers instead of them coming here to recruit ours. From 2001 to 2002, businesses with one to four employees, small businesses, added, added 25,371 new jobs, while businesses with five or more employees lost 153,996 jobs. Rather than providing strategies for strengthening and developing new small businesses and encouraging new entrepreneurs to develop their new ideas and concepts in Michigan, both political parties waste our time painting each other as the worst of the worst. In the meantime, our state has been given an F in 2005 and a D in 2006 for supporting entrepreneurs. In an article, um, it was stated that, uh, um, that we as a state need to pay greater attention to entrepreneurial education, economic development strategy, access to capital, technology commercialization, and developing a business climate that nurtures entrepreneurs. We didn't hear much about that in our last political season. Today I stand before you to applaud you for doing exactly what a recent study identified as the number one strategy for improving Michigan's economy. A new study that was just released this past June entitled A New Agenda for a New Michigan identified the number one strategy as being, quote, build a culture aligned with the flat world. And it goes on by identifying three characteristics of a successful culture aligned with the flat world. And listen carefully because, because this is what all of you are doing and modeling today. Characteristic number one, learning. As buyers and vendors, you are here because you want to learn more about what you can do to contribute to the development of a stronger and more inclusive economy. Characteristic number two, an entrepreneurial spirit. As vendors, you understand that being a business owner or being a productive employee is not an entitlement but requires hard work and constant improvement. And shortly, you will hear from Jessica and a success story of a true entrepreneur. Third and last, but certainly not least, a culture that is aligned with the flat world is a culture that is welcoming to all. This study recognizes the needs for building a culture that condemns rather than tolerates discrimination and segregation, <clears throat> welcomes with open arms, <clears throat> welcomes with open arms, talented people from all walks of life. It is truly unfortunate that we now have to overcome the passage of Proposal 2. But even this, we must overcome, and I'm confident that we are able to do so. Thank goodness for companies like our sponsors, Granger, OfficeMax, and Cisco, who understand that diversity increases the, the top and bottom lines of our financial statements. Thank goodness for <clears throat> institutions of higher learning who understand the value of diversity inside and outside of the classrooms. We at the Grand Rapids Chamber absolutely believe in the value of small business. We know that they are the backbone of our economy. We know that small businesses create 80% of the new jobs. We appreciate their contributions. Also at the Grand Rapids Chamber, we also understand and the importance of diversity as a business value. In spite of what Proposal 2 might do to this state, we cannot forget the importance of diversity as a business value. We are the only chamber in the nation that has diversity as one of its pillars, and I'm proud that the Grand Rapids Chamber has been joined by other chambers in West Michigan to the commitment to commitment to small business and diversity. And last but not least, I want to thank each one of you for being part of the solution 
and fighting for the value of diversity in our community. We have a lot of work to do, but you being here tells us that we are together the solution that this state needs. So thank you and have a profitable day. Bing, thank you so much. That's the kind of address I like, right to the point. <laughs> Jessica Ann Tyson, Parties by Jessica Ann. Jessica has been successful in connecting with some of us uh, in the public sector uh, as far as doing business with us. And we thought she'd be excellent to speak to you this morning on how to connect with the education sector. Jessica Ann. Good morning, everyone. Mansfield, I'm so glad you didn't call me like five minutes ago because my foot was asleep. <laughs> and I didn't know if I'd be able to actually walk up here, but I, I'm very glad I did. And I'm extremely excited to be here this morning. Um, again, my name is Jessica Ann Tyson uh, from Parties by Jessica Ann, which is a full-service event and party planning agency. And I'm sure that you all knew before you came here that Grand Valley State and GRCC are partying. <laughs> but technically... Yes and no. Um, I started my event planning company um, probably uh, at the age of 16 and didn't even realize it. I won't tell you how old I am, but I have a 14-year-old son and two marriages behind me. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But what happened was I started at McDonald's, you know, where you can go and get the Big Mac, filet fish quarter pounder french fries and all that good stuff and so I decided that I wanted a job 16 in high school needed some extra money to pay for my insurance the car that my parents just purchased for me and um, so I said okay cool get this job McDonald's put the hat on put the shirt on started partying at McDonald's on Wednesdays so much fun I had a great time and I became really popular the party planner there everyone wanted me to do their child's birthday party. So I'm thinking, oh, this is pretty cool. So decided to start doing parties on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And then after that, it was pretty much, okay, I can't be at McDonald's all my life, right? So all, all the jobs that I, I had, um, even through college, um, it was always a job that related with the community, a job that I would be the community developer, responsible for smoothing the CEOs and developing the parties and things of that nature. So it was very, 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 very fun, you can imagine. Um, long story short, decided um, my husband, that husband, he's not here, is he? I can talk about him. He, deci <laughs> he decided one day that he would cut my allowance. So I said to him, I said, you know, I, I didn't want to say it too nastily because, you know, we can, you know, women have the power to change a man sometimes. And so I said to him, I said, you know, um, how do you expect me to pay for certain things? I mean, you know, I, I need a dress every week and I need this and that new pair of shoes. And he says, you know what, you need to go ahead and you need to start charging people for those parties, weddings and events that you do. And I looked at him and I said, you know, do you think that they'll pay me for it? And he's, you know, they're paying somebody, but you just need to get out there and do it. And um, I said, okay. So I started doing a party here and that person's boss would be there and started a party over here and that person's boss would be there. And so before I knew it, within six months, I had a full-fledged business out of the home in an office environment and clients and one day I got a call that I was able to go in and meet with the regional alliance for purchasing and it ha so happened that Mansfield Matheson of GRCC and Esther Burns of Grand Valley State were in the room and uh, I gave a presentation I think it was the chocolate that did it I'm not sure <laughs> but uh, I gave them a presentation and um, they liked what I had to offer them um, they liked the fact that it was something that they needed, a service that they needed. And one great thing about it is that these individuals are so connected. It's not one of those things where you just walk in the door, and if you think it is, you know, open your, your eyes because the picture is much, much bigger. Walk in the door, and you're only going to be doing business with Mansfield or GRCC or Ms. Burns at uh, GBSU. They are so fabulous, and I want to say publicly thank you very much because they are so great at referring my business, but it's because I do good business. 
very creative, unique design, things of that nature. So they're willing to refer my business to other institutions that are looking for someone like me in my service industry to provide services. So open your eyes. Make sure that you don't just focus on one particular organization. And when you do, make sure that you develop that relationship. It is a little bit interesting because they do get these calls every single day. They do get the um, materials and brochures sent to their office. But make sure that you try to make a personal um, contact with them, a face-to-face, -face, so that you'll have the opportunity to be remembered, hopefully, by them. If you don't have your leg fall asleep or something of that nature, you can actually walk to the office. But just know that, you know, they are there. And I am, again, so excited to have them as clients. Um, they're very, very good clients. And the fact that, again, they're always pushing me to do better for myself. Uh, did it, an event, uh, and Mrs. Burns, of course, she emailed me. She let me know what I did wrong. But you know what? That's exactly what I, I needed. I think it was only one thing, though. <laughs> but it was an okay thing. It was okay. It was an okay thing, I think. But, you know, but she let me know. And her giving me that feedback, and because I asked for it, just like I asked Mansfield, is there anything else that you would do to, to improve my service, or that I could do to improve my services? Um, that allows me to be able to service when they do send me a referral to be able to service them better. And I appreciate that, especially being a small business. And um, I am also under the leadership of, of being through the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce. And he's an excellent leader in the fact that he's very much into small business and recognizes the, the opportunities of entrepreneurship. And I'm excited about that because when it comes down to it, this is really what the country is all about. It's about small businesses making a connection. Also, West Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. It's about businesses connecting with businesses, making sure, like Mansfield said, making sure that each business is not just standing on its own, being told us. He said, each one of us need to be responsible to make sure that we're participating. Valencia, I think, said, making sure that we um, do business with inside of our small businesses because it's not every day that you, you're, you're going to get a call from a big institution but believe me it can happen and if it can happen to me somebody that's just partying all the time I'm sure that it can happen to a lot of you out there again be persistent Make sure that you're not a bugaboo, though. Hey, is that an accurate word that I could use, man? So a bugaboo. Make sure that you're not bugging um, them, but make sure that you are um, being persistent and making sure that you have something that you can offer them. And then make sure that you follow the steps. If you get the cards today or give the cards, make sure that you follow up because it's very important. Because, again, they may meet three different type of people um, today that do your business and seven, seven different people that do your business tomorrow. But... Again, be persistent. So thank you so much. I appreciate this opportunity of being here. I appreciate the fact that I can do business with higher education, and so can you. Both Bing and Jessica, I can't sing their praises enough. I've used both of them professionally. I've used both of them personally. And uh, they have wonderful businesses, and they do do what they say they do. Now, at this time, I'm going to entertain your questions for both the panel and for Bing and Jessica, if you have any for them. So, first hand I see go up, I'll bring you the microphone. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, because Proposal 2 did pass, how do you see that impacting how universities and organizations will do business in Michigan? I have warned our panel that will be the first question. Esther? I'll start. Um, at Grand Valley State, I, I don't know that it will affect us in a huge way outside of um, the, the procurement environment. Let's, let's speak to maybe their admissions, unlike um, you know, another colleague who had specific numbers, and um, ours is a more well-rounded program for entry level. I don't know that that, that will be affected um, dramatically, and certainly I don't want to speak to that, as, and I, I know that our new president will be address, uh, addressing that issue with, with others in the community. But um, 
I, I, I think people need to be aware that it, it may impact some of the other offerings that um, the uh, public institutions of Michigan have to offer. And so those are some things that everyone, you know, will uh, need to take a serious look at how it's going to affect you and your personal lives. From the procurement standpoint of view, um, fortunately, we've had over the years more of a good faith effort program. Obviously, goals to increase and, and improve the economy as best as we can influence that. But um, because of that good faith effort, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's all about being inclusive. And, and we want to make sure that, that we have that opportunity for everyone to participate in, in the contracts. Um, again, because we, we have not had the specific numbers uh, attached to our program, I don't know that it will be um, you know, influencing our programs that dramatically right now. Um, it's still the right thing to do, and I think it's our responsibility to make sure that um, the services that we're providing as far as an educational institution is all-inclusive. We, we should have our supplier diversity um, in, in our vendor base as well. It should mirror the, the customers that we serve within the institution. Um, and, and beyond. So I don't know that it'll have a major impact on what we're doing, but we certainly will address where we go from here. Well, let me just uh, respond to it from the, uh, um, from the business side of it. Uh, I, I'm, I, I think that it seems somewhat uh, disheartening to have this proposal passed. But on the other hand, I think what, what Esther said really is, is what our, our viewpoint ought to be. I mean, if you are in business, and if the purchasing agents here, they want to be able to purchase the best product at the best price, irregardless. And I think the other part that I, when I was working with the city of Grand Rapids and trying to help them understand the importance of, of, uh, of the diverse uh, economy, is to say to them, look at 33% of the, of the population within the city limits of Grand Rapids are racial minorities. They are your tax dollars. And those tax dollars ought to be used in a way that is returned to the communities that contributes to that. So I think, you know, I think proposal two, I mean, what, what really is unfortunate is because Ward Connolly is sitting in California counting its millions and leaving us in this terrible disarray. So, but, but on the other hand, I, I don't think we need to be able to be discouraged. I think we ought to just go ahead and, and listen to what Esther said, and I'm sure it would probably be echoed by the other purchasers, that our commitment for this, for, as, as purchasers and our commitment as, as uh, vendors is to provide the best possible products at the best possible prices. And if we continue with that process, then certainly, you know, they will, they will certainly adhere to that as well. Next question. My question goes, um, if one of the early questions with with your minimums, you talked about departments having a purchasing card. Would that be similar to like a debit card or a credit card, where they, where you need, where I would need to be able to accept that type of a, an, an electronic transaction? Um, yeah, actually, ours is a Mastercard. That's exactly what it is, Michigan State University Mastercard. So, um, I really do recommend that small business uh, people make sure that they can take credit cards. Not just for that business, but I also think that that's a great uh, lead-in, segue, foot in the door uh, to do business with Michigan State. As you can establish yourself uh, providing some services, maybe not at real high price points, just using the purchasing card. Um, and if you've done some good work, then maybe when the bigger opportunities come up, you can get a contract. So. I, I have a um, branding question. This is kind of a micro question. but. I get requests from departments that want me to do things, and I have an embroidery business, and I know it's not within the institution's branding. And, and sometimes it makes me uncomfortable and I steer them because I want it to, you know, exemplify the work that's been done. But other times it's just so cavalier that I feel like I should distance myself from the job because I don't want it associated with my business. Am I taking this too serious, or is there something I should I'll address that it, it's it's very serious and and I think you're in um, the way you're responding is is appropriate um, our campus knows that our, our logos are branded now our, our trademarks 
And um, in order to reproduce those images, you need to be licensed. Now, we are still working on um, making that available to our campus in a more friendly environment. The, the, um, our, our local manager of the um, trademark um, process it doesn't have the best website just yet to speak to the non-retail um, purchases which a lot of our, our departments are involved with, and those are the people that you're hearing from. They do a very good job nationally for retail merchandise, working with our bookstores and the local um, you know, establishment at the malls and what have you. But as far as the, the internal traffic, which is huge, it's huge. Um, they haven't done a real good job there as far as um, having the, the list available for those vendors that are certified or license, I should say. So um, by all means, if you're in that position, you're asked to provide merchandise you know, from our departments that, that does use our, our logos and trademarks, you do need to be certified. So by all means, let them know that I am not certified as of yet. I'll contact the purchasing department because certainly I want to continue with the order. And it's not um, as major of an ordeal as it is for the, the retail side of the house. So um, contact us, and we can certainly walk you through that process. Thanks for that question. Excellent. We have time for about two more questions before we move on to the business opportunity forum down the hall. More questions? You have a lot of expertise here. Don't be shy. Right. Well, let's give our panel and our speakers a hand once more. And again, we thank you for being here, and we'll dismiss at this point and go down the hall for the forum. Thank you.